Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing groups of order PQ. Okay, right. So, we are in the process of trying to prove that the centralizer of this uh, C log P subgroup, capital P here, in the group capital G, must equal the entire group, and we're doing it by proof by contradiction, so we've assumed that it's not equal to the entire group. We've shown that because P is a normal subgroup in capital G, then the centralizer of capital P in G must be a normal subgroup, and we're now saying we can quotient G out by that centralizer of capital P in G, and the order of the quotient group that we get must be either P times Q, P or Q, but it's not going to equal uh, 1 because we've assumed that the centralizer of P and G is not equal to the entire group, it's not the improper subgroup. Okay, now, we're going to use this to arrive at a contradiction, uh, but firstly, what we have to do is we need to study this quotient group in more detail. We need to understand uh, what the cosets that the centralizer of P and G is actually going to divide G into actually represent. So let me draw a picture then for this. I'll just move this up. Okay, so we'll have our uh, group shown by this box here. So this will be the entire group, capital G. Okay, and I'll just colour that in, in green, like so. And then we'll mark on the subgroup, which is the centralizer of P and G. Okay, so here is the centralizer of P and G. Now, let me just give you a little bit more insight into what the centralizer of P and G truly is. So remember, capital P is this subgroup of G. The centralizer of capital P in G is all of those elements which, when they conjugate the entire subgroup, capital P, fix absolutely every single element. So effectively, it's all the elements of the group capital G, which, when you consider the automorphism that they would create on the normal subgroup capital P, so remember, all of the elements capital G, when you use them to conjugate capital P, because capital P is a normal subgroup, we know that it's a normal subgroup uh, if we're working uh, with uh, a group of order PQ where P does not divide Q minus 1, because it's a normal subgroup, they must all send it back onto itself. So when they are used to conjugate the entire subgroup, then they send it onto itself. They stabilize the entire subgroup, but not all elements of the group are necessarily, uh, well, we're assuming at the moment that not all elements of the group are actually going to fix every single element of that subgroup, capital P. The centralizer of P and G is that subgroup of G of elements which do fix absolutely every single element and therefore represent the identity automorphism of P. And what we're going to see is that the cosets of this would represent all of the elements in G which represent different automorphisms of capital P. Okay? Right, so what we're now going to do is partition up capital G into these cosets, like so. So I'll do this like so. We'll have five in our picture, but more generally it'll be P times Q Q or P, okay? Uh, and what I want to do is give an interpretation of these cosets, and I've already given you it, i.e. that all the elements in a coset, when you use them to conjugate capital P, are going to all represent the exact same automorphism of P, uh, but let me actually show you that now. Okay, so let's say that we have a coset here. Okay, and let's say it contains an element capital A. So let's say this is the, well not capital A, little a. Okay, so this is the coset A bar, the coset that contains A. Then all the other elements in here are of the form A times an element of the centralizer of uh, P and G. Now, what we can do is we can create an automorphism of capital P for every single element of capital G. Okay, so I'll do this for little a. So what I can consider is this mapping phi sub a, which will be an automorphism of the subgroup capital P onto itself, of course. Okay, and the way that this will work is it will map all little r in capital P onto what they are after they've been conjugated uh, by little a. Okay, so we'll just conjugate the entire subgroup, and we know we must get the entire subgroup back again because it's a normal subgroup. Okay, so you can do this for whatever element of the group you like, and as I say, if a was an element of the centralizer of PNG, it would just represent the identity automorphism. Okay, now, if we assume that A is not in the centralizer of P and G, then it's not going to be the identity automorphism, i.e. some of the elements of P are going to be changed by conjugation by A. 
Now, my claim is that if I take another element in the same coset as A, which will be of the form A times S, where S is an element of the centralizer of P and G, then it will represent the exact same automorphism, i.e. if I look at now phi uh, sub A composed with S here, this will map all little r onto exactly the same thing. And let me show you that. Okay, well, by definition, it will map all little r onto as conjugating r. Okay, so as, and then we'll need the inverse of this, s inverse, a inverse. Now, of course, s uh, composed with r composed with s, so the s conjugate of r, that's just going to equal little r because s is in the centralizer of p and g. So this is little r, and therefore overall this is just the a conjugate of little r, so just conjugate little r by a, and that's what it's going to send all little r onto. So truly, all of the elements that are in the same coset are representing the exact same automorphism of capital P. Okay, excellent. So we're starting to get some understanding here. The next thing I need to show you is that if I go into a different coset, so let's go up here and have B, so this is the coset B bar. Okay, so if I'm in a different coset, that these elements in different cosets must represent different automorphisms. Okay, and then we'll truly have an understanding of what uh, co uh, quotienting out by the centralizer of P and G is actually going to do here. Okay, right. So now what I want to consider is uh, showing you that phi of A is not equal to phi of B. Okay, so they're not the same automorphism. So how can I do this? Well, let's assume the opposite and prove a contradiction. Okay, and remember the initial assumption is that they're in different cosets. So we're going to show that if it was the case that they represent the same automorphism, they'd actually be in the same coset, and therefore we'd arrive at a contradiction because we're assuming they're in different cosets. Okay, so um, let's do this. Um, so if they were representing the exact same automorphism, let's say A and B were representing the exact same automorphism okay, of P, Okay, they do the exact same automorphism when you conjugate, uh, use them to conjugate all the elements of capital P, then it would be true that if we conjugate by B inverse, that would invert conjugation by A, i.e. if I consider phi of, let's say, B inverse A, this would be the identity map. Okay, so if we consider this, okay, let's just think about this. So we'd conjugate R by B inverse A, and what we do is then we'd need the inverse of this, which would be A inverse B, like so. So we conjugate it by A firstly, and then we conjugate it by B inverse. Now, conjugating by B inverse would certainly invert uh, the mapping done by conjugation by B, and I'm saying that the mapping done by conjugation by B is the same as the mapping done by the conjugation by A, and therefore it must invert it as well. So this would just be equal to R. So that would imply that B inverse A was an element of the centralizer of P and G, i.e. it was some little s. But that's a contradiction because now I could just conjugate both sides by, sorry, compose B on both sides and this becomes A is equal to B times S, i.e. A would be in the same coset as B. Okay, so there is your proof that if you've got elements that are in different cosets of the centralizer of P and G, when we use them to conjugate this subgroup capital P, they must represent different automorphisms of capital P. Okay, they're not going to be the same automorphism, otherwise you can prove that they'd be in the same coset as each other. Okay, so brilliant. We now have this understanding then of uh, the cosets of the centralizer of P and G. All the elements in a coset of the centralizer of P and G are representing a certain, uh, well, if we use them to conjugate capital P by, will all uh, be representing the same automorphism of capital P. What I now want to show you is that actually composition in this quotient group would respect composition of the maps, the conjugation maps, these automorphisms of capital P, and therefore truly that this quotient group we get here is going to be isomorphic to a subgroup of the automorphism group of P. Okay, so what I want to show you is that if I compose two of these together, okay, so I'm now agreed that each coset is going to represent a certain automorphism of capital P. What I want to show is that if I compose these two together, the overall map is now the same as the composite of the two maps. Okay, so if I, for instance, took 
A bar composed with B bar, well of course this will be the coset that contains um, the composition of two representatives from here, so it will contain A composed with B, okay, so just by definition of the way quotient groups work, this will be A composed with B bar here. What I want to show is that the mapping that this will represent, the automorphism this will represent, is the same as the automorphism of this one followed by the automorphism of this one, i.e. composition in here is exactly representing the composition of the automorphisms. Okay, so what automorphism does this represent? Well, of course, it's just going to be the automorphism where we conjugate by uh, A composed with B. Okay, so it will map any little R onto A, B, R, and then the inverse of this is B inverse, A inverse, so R conjugated by A composed with B. But, of course, this is exactly what you would get if you firstly did the automorphism for the coset B bar, okay, which of course is the automorphism where we conjugate by little b here, okay, and then we did the mapping for A. So indeed, uh, which is the uh, automorphism associated with the coset A bar here, so indeed, composition of these cosets of the centralizer of P and G in this quotient group does respect composition of the automorphisms that they represent of the uh, group, subgroup capital P. Okay, so truly what we can now conclude then is that G quotiented out, and I'll just move this up, G quotiented out by the centralizer of P and G is going to be isomorphic to a subgroup, which I'll call capital H, of um, the automorphism group of P, but of course the Group, subgroup capital P is just isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements, okay, because it was a subgroup of size P, and therefore this automorphism group is going to be the automorphism group of ZP here. Okay, so I hope you understand why that is true. It's because each coset can be seen as representing a automorphism of capital P, as I've shown you, and I've now shown you that the composition of the cosets respects the com sorry respects the composition of the um, automorphisms that they represent. So truly, you can think of the composition of the cosets as just being the composition of the automorphisms that they represent. Okay, and then. Therefore, this must be isomorphic to a subgroup of the automorphism group of the cyclic group uh, on the set of P elements. But what is the automorphism group on the uh, cyclic group on the set of P elements? Well, let's just think about the cyclic group on the set of P elements. Okay, so this contains, we'll just have the symbol 0, 1, all the way up to P minus 1 here. And of course, composition is just addition modulo P here. Now, all of the non-identity elements, 1, 2, all the way up to P minus 1, they all have order P and are all algebraically equivalent to one another. They could all be used to generate this subgroup, uh, sorry, this group. Um, so, in fact, all that differs between this one, 2, all the way up to P minus 1, is the symbols that you're using. And in fact, you could relabel up 1 with any of these. So you could relabel up 1 as 2, you could relabel up 1 as 3, all the way up to you could relabel 1 with P minus 1. Okay, and those will all be automorphisms. And the instant you've decided what you're going to relabel up 1 as, what you're relabeling everything else up as is instantly determined. Okay? And the reason for that is that everything else is just a power of 1, if you like. It's just 1 plus 1 plus 1 a certain number of times. So each one of the elements here can be written as 1 composed with itself a certain number of times. Okay, so the instant you've told me where the automorphism of this, um, the automorphism of the cyclic group on the set of P elements is taking 1 to, it's instantly determined. So let me just write a little bit down here. So if I've got an automorphism of the cyclic group on the set of P elements onto itself, then all you actually need to tell me is where does 1 go? Okay, all I need to know is where does 1 go? I know the identity has to go to the identity. All you need to tell me is where 1 goes, because the instant I know where 1 goes, everything else can just be written as 1 plus 1 plus 1 a certain number of times, and therefore, because we want the automorphism to obey compatibility with composition, we just um, map any other element onto phi of 1 
plus phi of 1 the same number of times as that an element you want to work out where it's going to is 1 plus 1 that many times. Okay, so it's probably best if I do an example rather than trying to explain it. So if 3 is an element in here, that will be 1 plus 1 plus 1. So if you want to work out what phi of 3 is going to be, it's just going to be phi of 1 plus phi of 1 plus phi of 1, because you could split 3 down into 1 plus 1 plus 1 and then just apply compatibility here. Okay, and addition is being used as the composition symbol here, okay, because this is addition modulo p is an interpretation of this. Okay, so you only need to tell me where 1 goes, and you can send 1 onto any of these other ones. You can send 1 onto 2, you can send 1 onto 3, 1 all the way up to p minus 1, because they're all algebraic the equivalents. Okay, they all have the same order, they all generate the group, and they truly are just the same element, just with different symbols used to denote it. Okay, so that means that the number of automorphisms of the cyclic group on the set of p elements, the order of this group is just going to be p minus 1, because you can send 1 onto p minus 1 different things. You can send it onto itself, that's the identity map. You can send it onto 2, you can send it onto 3, all the way to sending it onto p minus 1. You cannot send it onto 0, that would not be an automorphism. Okay, so the set of automorphisms of the cyclic group uh, on the set of p elements has order p minus 1. Now that's a problem, there's a snag here, okay, because we are now saying that g quotiented out by the centralizer of p and g is isomorphic to a subgroup of a group of order p minus 1. Now what was the order of this? The order of this was either p times q, q, or p. Okay, and we're now saying that this is isomorphic to a subgroup of a group of order p minus 1. The problem is, all of these possibilities are bigger than this. p is bigger than this, obviously. q is bigger than p, so q is bigger than this, and p times q is certainly bigger than this. Okay, so there's a snag. It's, it doesn't work. It's rubbish. Okay, this cannot be isomorphic to a subgroup of the automorphism group of the cyclic group on the set of p elements because it's simply too big. Okay, so we go right back to our initial assumption, therefore, that the centralizer of p and g was not equal to the entire group, and that must have been wrong. Okay, so therefore we can conclude that the centralizer of p and g must have been equal to the entire group, and therefore when we quotient out by it, we'll just get the trivial group, okay, i.e. all elements of the group uh, will effectively represent the automorphism of P, which is the identity automorphism, and therefore it will be a subgroup of the automorphism group of the cyclic group on the set of P elements. It will just be that uh, trivial subgroup that just contains the identity automorphism. Okay, but now what we can conclude, therefore, is that if I conjugate x, which is an element of p, by y, it fixes it. Okay, y represents this uh, identity automorphism on the uh, subgroup capital P, okay, so it fixes all elements, but in particular it fixes x, and therefore the x composed with y is equal to y composed with x, and that tells us completely how composition now works on our group capital G. Okay, we just add the powers of x modulo p and add the powers of y modulo q, and therefore this element x composed with y does indeed have order p q, so I can conclude therefore that g is isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of PQ elements. Okay, right, so just to finish with a few examples then, so if we have um, a group, okay, of order 15, you can instantly say what that's isomorphic to. Okay, the, there's only one possibility, okay, there's only one group up to isomorphism of order 15, and it's the cyclic group on the set of 15 elements. The same is true for a group of order 33, and indeed for any group of order 1 prime times another prime, where the smaller prime does not divide the bigger prime, subtract 1. Okay, and with that we will end this discussion.